Talk's the main medium of classroom education and teachers can use it to guide the thinking and the learning of their students. They can do it in more than one way. A most obvious way is through monologue and that can be very effective if teachers provide very clear instructions or present clearly a new topic with the relevant concepts and so on. This can be very useful for students. However, the limitation of monologue is that it doesn't involve the students actively in constructing new knowledge for themselves. For that to happen, we need dialogue in the classroom, in which both teachers and students are taking an active role, in which students have to try and think how they put their developing understanding into new words, and how they are able to um, respond to questions from the teacher which involve them in some thinking through of new ideas. In most classrooms, enough monologue takes place. What we probably need to achieve is a better balance between the amount of monologue and the amount of genuine dialogue that takes place in most classrooms. From our observations of children working in groups in the classroom and from observing adults as well working in groups, we know that people often don't necessarily use that opportunity to think well and collectively together. Sometimes you'll get what we call disputational talk, which where people just argue in a futile way, yes it is, no it's not, well you're stupid anyway. That's surprisingly common in classrooms. And it's not really much help to anyone. Rather better, you get what we call cumulative talk, in which everybody contributes and ideas are shared. That can be very useful, but what it still lacks is a sort of critical examination of ideas in which people challenge perhaps what other people have said, in which people give reasons to justify what they've said, and in which everybody's trying to build on what's there to create some new joint understanding. For that to happen, we need what we call exploratory talk. And that doesn't really happen enough in classrooms, or probably not much better in the rest of life. It's the kind of talk that probably is generally the kind of talk that we need to work well in teams, to solve problems, um, and to generally achieve things collectively. In exploratory talks, students are taught how to engage critically and constructively with each other's ideas. How is this achieved? Because exploratory talk doesn't happen enough naturally in classrooms, or probably in other situations too, we really need to teach young people how to do it. And the best way we've found is for a teacher to ask the students themselves what they think makes discussion productive or unproductive. Get them to reflect on how they work in groups and when it works well and when it works badly. And usually you find that they will come up with lots of insights. Um, that They will begin probably by saying, well, it works well if everybody joins in. And they may say, it doesn't work well if one person just dominates the whole discussion and talks all the time. And a teacher can make a note of these and kind of consolidate a list of reasons that t uh, students have given for talk working well or, or working badly. So once students' awareness of how they use talk themselves has been raised, a teacher can work with them to construct a set of what we call ground rules for how to work together in group. Um, by ground rules, we really mean the sort of norms that apply to social behaviour in the group, how people should choose to behave to make the talk and the group work well. Um, there are examples of these in our uh, Thinking Together uh, materials in the, on the website, on the Thinking Together website for example, and some lesson plans for how students can be encouraged to develop these ground rules. Basically, the ground rules are just um, the definition of exploratory talk laid out as a set of, of, of kind of imperatives. So, for example, everyone will contribute to the group discussion. We will give reasons for our views. We can challenge reasons, though we'll do so in a respectful way. And we'll try and reach agreement at the end of the discussion. So those are the kind of ground rules that um, teachers can build with a uh, group of students, with a whole class. And they can then agree that they will apply those uh, when they work together in groups. So the teacher's role, on the one hand, is to raise students' own awareness of how they use talk collectively and how they can learn to use it better, and to set up conditions in which students can develop the kind of skills that are necessary for carrying out exploratory talk. But it's also crucial to realise that the teacher is probably the only role model students will have for using talk to reason. Um, they may not have heard reasoned discussions anywhere else in their lives, 
Uh, and if, so if the teacher isn't really going to show them how it's done and engage in dialogues that model that exploratory talk, they're going to be rather at a loss for how to do it. And research has shown that the biggest influence on how students talk together in groups is how their teacher talks to them. The principles I've, I've outlined so far are the basis for the thinking together approach to developing talking classrooms that my colleagues and I, working with teachers, have devised over, over the years. The aim of it essentially is to, is to help students become more effective at using language for thinking collectively because that is really the distinctive nature of human intelligence that we can join our brains together in a sort of mega brain and think in a way that is greater than the sum of the parts. That is one of the crucial reasons why our species is the dominant one on the planet, for better or worse. Um, but we have to learn how to think collectively using language well. We're not hardwired to do it like the bees are, for example. So an important aspect of education, which is highlighted in the Thinking Together approach, is that students are taught how to use language in this way most effectively. I'm sometimes asked to justify why I think it's so important that young people learn to use exploratory talk. And the reason is that advances in science, arts, technology, humanitarian causes and politics only really happen when people effectively combine their brain power to address issues. The idea that advances such as those depend on the endeavours of a lone genius is completely misguided. It isn't really historically the way things have worked. As a species, our intelligence is distinctive because it is intrinsically social. We are able to link up our brains into a sort of mega brain in which our contributions are greater than the sum of the parts and we are able to solve problems collectively in that way. And we use language to do so. But unlike species like the bees who have a hardwired language kind of already programmed into the brain, although we are designed to learn language, we have to learn it and we have to learn to use it well. And so students need the kind of experience that will enable them to develop those skills that will mean that they can take part in collective endeavours, solve problems together and contribute to uh, the advance of understanding in, in whatever field they're engaged in. We found that the thinking together approach doesn't only help young people learn how to talk and work together better in groups. We found that by engaging in that kind of collaborative reasoning, that kind of collective thinking, they actually become better at reasoning on their own. And this supports a Vygotskyan model of the development of human cognition, in which there is a, a, an iterative relationship between the social and the individual. So it's almost like they become able to carry on these critical, constructive discussions in their own heads, which is what an intelligent person and an educated person uh, should really be able to do. And the way it became most apparent in our research is when we found that students were able to improve their scores on a test of reasoning, um, the Raven's progressive matrices, and they improved their scores much more than students in a control uh, set who weren't given this kind of thinking together training. We found that as well as the effects on the development of students' reasoning, that those students who'd been in classes where they'd learned how to use exploratory talk and practiced it over time, um, were able to apply it to their study of other curriculum subjects. In our case, uh, we particularly looked at maths and science. And they improved their performances on standardised national tests compared with students who hadn't had the thinking together experience. This was partly, I think, because they were able to work better in groups and therefore learn together more effectively and uh, address themselves more productively to the problems they were given, the tasks they were given. But it may well be also because through that experience of thinking together, they were learning individual reasoning skills, which meant they could apply those to the study of these curriculum subjects too. And I think that if a focus on the development of talk and reasoning is maintained through students' school careers, um, it can have continuing benefits on how they progress through the school system. And of course, they're learning life skills as well, which would uh, stand them in good stead when they go out to work in the wider world. I think there are some clear implications for educational practice from the research I've described and what we've found and, and what, what researchers in other countries working on the similar issues have found as well. And one of them is 
that children need to be taught in school how to use spoken language effectively. There tends to be an assumption that it just happens, that children just learn how to talk. They don't need any special help with it. They'll need to be taught long division or chemistry or something. But, you know, just go and talk in your groups and, and, and we, we'll assume you can do it. But it, as I've tried to explain, that isn't likely to be the case for many children. If they haven't heard reasoned discussions or, or been able to see quite how you construct them, they're not going to be able to do so. They probably don't appreciate themselves how important talk is for learning. And so that's one strong implication that talk should be on the curriculum. A second one is that, for educational practice, that teachers need to realise quite how important their role is, that they probably are the only role model for exploratory talk. They may not, for many children, they may not actually experience that kind of talk in their outer school lives, and so their teacher may be the only person who can show them how it's done. And obviously the teacher can enable them through setting appropriate tasks and guidance to help them understand the language of particular subjects, to talk in a rational and constructive way about any of the topics that they're studying. So I think that's the second implication. When it comes to research in psychology, uh, education and linguistics, um, then I think what's needed there is a stronger appreciation of the nature and functions of talk. Talk isn't just a medium for exchanging ideas, for tr transmitting ideas from one head to another, for conveying information. It's also not only for setting up complex social structures and enabling social events to take place in a way that's smooth and, 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 uh, and, and effective. What it is primarily and essentially is a system of communication that has evolved with our species to enable us to solve problems collectively. And that is really the essence of, of, of its nature. And I think it needs to be researched in that way, to be understood as a system for enabling people to think collectively. And I think if we start to see it in that way, then some of the questions we'll ask in research will be slightly different and they will probably come up with some more uh, productive and useful answers.